All right, just uh, starting a new series here, a brief, not going to be a a year long like Nehemiah was, (laughs) and all the people said. (laughs) This will be two years, actually. No, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Amen. So once you get that, turn your Bibles. It, it, It will be... Just want to make sure everyone's looking at it. Everyone get one of those. I have another one up here if you need it. There you go, my friend. All righty, turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Matthew and chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. And I'll read verse 18, a word of prayer, and we'll get started. I'll back up to verse 17. Uh, this is uh, upon the profession or uh, confession of Peter. Um, and uh, when Jesus is asking his disciples, um, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Verse 13, verse 14, they said, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias or Elijah, and others Jeremiah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? Boy, and that, how you answer that question will determine your eternal destiny. Amen? Verse 15, he saith unto them, uh, I'm sorry, verse 16, And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he said, You are the Christ, that's the chosen one, the Messiah, the Son of the living God, the Son of God. So both his human and his eternal identity. Verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse, uh, let's pray. Father, we're thankful. Uh, that, um, Lord, we are a part of something here that is spiritual, that it's not just, uh, not just a club or a, a corporation, uh, Lord, just a, a social gathering or a political assembly, but, God, we are here, and it is, an orga- it is a spiritual organism, and you are the head. And, God, I pray that we would uh, understand that, respect that, and appreciate that, that this is very special the church. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The, um, let me also read for you uh, Ephesians, um, of Ephesians in chapter 5, Ephesians in chapter 5, in verse 23, the Bible says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the savior of the body. Um, so Christ is the head and founder of the local New Testament church. And I wanted to just teach a few weeks that's sort of a little bit out of our I Am Resolved theme coming into the new year. And that was understanding uh, who the, our, a little bit of our history. And some of being resolved is understanding in the midst of modern Christianity, it's important that we understand our heritage. You know, uh, there's a famous um, historian, a British historian, and he made a very simple statement. He said, you don't know where you're going unless you know where you've been. And we can be adrift even as professing Christianity or Christendom or what have you. People can be in the name of Christ or in the name of Christianity say, well, we need to go in this direction. We need to go in that direction. 
And there are churches now that are affirming things in the Bible that are absolutely plain black and white and are evil. The Bible says this is absolutely wrong. This is sin. God judged people. God fried people for it. And yet uh, nowadays we are going to, because things have changed and times have changed and we have to express love to our fellow man, it's okay to do this and appreciate and encompass this in the local church. And that's where we're at today. And I'm not saying my soul. I mean, I, I mean, I got a whole message that I, one of these I am resolved is to go be a loving neighbor and, and, and be a help and, and have hospitality and invite people in your home and, and be a help. And amen. I, so I'm all about that. OK, but there's a difference. I'm not talking about your evangelism to the lost world. I'm not saying that. I'm not talking about your Christian compassion for lost people. I'm not talking about that. Man, you ought to go and do whatever. I don't care who they are. I don't care how they smell. I don't care how they're dressed. I don't care what uh, condition they're in. I don't care what their behavior is. we got to love them and bring them to Jesus. Amen. That's, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about evangelism. I'm talking about the local New Testament church. It's a little different. Okay? Does that make sense? Because that, those lines have sort of been erased and a lot of the, like the, like the, the big mega modern church growth movement is to be evangelistic. So I'm not going to provide so many distinctions in the local church about membership or programs or what have you. It's going to be, I want this to be, everybody can come in and be comfortable to do whatever they want. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? So, and uh, I mean, I've heard, I mean, I, mean, I, I won't name names, I'm just, but I've heard big name preachers that many of you would recognize, and they'd say, uh, the church isn't for saved people. Literally, that's a direct quote. That everything they do is for lost people to come in and feel comfortable to preach them the gospel. And, I'm, and, and there's part of that where I'm like, absolutely, everybody should feel comfortable when you walk in here. Right? Even if you're lost. But you understand. I, I, that, that's another, that's a whole trail of thought that takes, that takes uh, some nuance to discuss. I'm just trying to, I just wanted to give a couple weeks to talk about the identity of the local church. And there's a heritage that we follow that still is connected to what we are and why we are distinct today. In who we, you know, because here's the thing. If you are something, that means you are simultaneously not something. Can I just talk about like the raw physics of life, right? If A equals A, or if A equals B, then, or I'm sorry, if A is not B, then B is not A, right? Right? I mean, if, if you, it, it, I remember uh, hearing one preacher, he said, You'll learn a lot. Of, he said, listen, you will um, uh, you will gain people in your church by people who leave your church. He, meaning, he said, they'll leave over some issues, but that very issue might be something that will attract people to your church. It's your identity. And not, you're not like trying to drive people away. I'm just being a jerk. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, but the identity of who you are means that you are not something else. But he, And here's the thing. I, again, I got to keep defaulting back to our modern contemporary environment. Because nowadays it's like, oh, I can be two things at the same time. We are like overrun with Eastern mysticism, right? I can be A and B at the same time. My identity is fluid. Get the point? I mean, so, uh, so you know, I can be... So I, I'm, I'm just, let me just get into it, okay? I mean, I can set it up for a, a long time, but let me just get into it. So what I want to look at is understanding the local church is a spiritual organism that Jesus Christ created. Um, and for time's sake, I really want to get into this, but I, there's a lot of setup and other nuances to this and prophecies in the Old Testament, even talking about John the Baptist. That word Baptist is a Bible name, amen? 
Now, uh, the, the, the history of the Baptists, uh, it was not something that they grabbed and said, hey, we will take that name and apply it to ourselves. They didn't do that. They were called that in a derogatory manner initially. But we'll get into that later on. But I will understand that John came baptizing people. And he was called a Baptist before he started baptizing people. But that's a deeper story there. But what I want to look at today is I just want to talk. I just want to come out of the chute and say, what are the marks of a New Testament church? Right. So when you open your Bible and you go, hmm, I wonder if if the you know, if there's church A, B, C and D and they're kind of different. Well, what makes A different than B and different than C and different? Than, is there a is there a standard that I can appeal to? To maybe put a spotlight and, and sort of, you know, figure out what this might be? You know, has anyone ever heard of profiling? Like FBI, you know, profiling, right? The profiling. I read a book uh, called Mindhunter by Jack Douglas. He was one of the initial uh, FBI profilers. And um, so... He would take evidence and he would look at behavior and he would build a profile and say, okay, we think the person that would commit this heinous murder in that manner, they would desecrate the body and position it or do this with that. It's like, and they would, they would take that and they would, from all of that and the understanding of psychology and all that, and they would then build a profile and say, you know, the person that committed that is probably a white male in their 30s who's, you know, has liberty to drive around me, but they're a truck driver. No offense to truck drivers. And, uh, you know, I'm just riffing here, and you know maybe they have his you know income or an, or an educational level, blah 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 blah, and they build this profile, and then when they go and find a suspect, they'll find who fits that profile. So you know that we can what we can do is we can go to the New Testament, like you know the New Testament here, and we can go and start building a profile of a New Testament church, what a church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we can see that it's got some spe specialized markers. Do you believe that? Well, this, is, this outline that I gave you is not the only outline of New Testament marks uh, of, of a, what it is, a identifying marks of a New Testament church. But this happens to be, it's, it's like a little mnemonic device that helps you remember them. Remember, eight of them anyway. And so it's an acrostic. So the first letter spells out B-A-P-T-I-S-T-S, -T -S, Baptists. Tricked you. Now, um, like I said, there's, you can go in different directions. There's other, uh, you know, even, uh, and, and by the way, some people that aren't too hip on, on this because it doesn't have a prioritization, right? Like after biblical authority, some would say, well, it should be saved church membership. You know, that, that should be the most important thing. So it's not in a list of priority because it spells a, a name, you know what I mean? So, so it's, uh, but let's look at this. And these are eight marks. Now there's a, there's a number more of them, which we'll get into, but these are eight marks of a New Testament church. So if I go and get the Bible and say, okay, there's Mark 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, I can say, now, what churches today look close to the, look as close to the, as close to this as possible? And what church throughout history has been more faithful to these marks of the New Testament church than other churches? I'm going to get into that next week. But tonight, let's just look at this real quick. We, I mean, I'm an independent Baptist, okay? Baptist is a general term, um, but independent is, it's not affiliated with any particular structure or uh, uh, like a, um, uh, like the Southern Baptist or, or any convention or any open confession, right? Um, because, I mean, even the Southern Baptists are, 
it's a free association of churches, but they're very tied in, and they have particular things, and they, you know, they'll give uh, to the Lottie Moon uh, uh, missions program, and they give certain monies. To, and so there's, they're very tied in uh, on a political way, in an organizational way, in a financial way. So there's, it's different. But even though they're Baptist, we would share much doctrine, of course. But this word independent is what we are here. And uh, so I put a little blurb in there. There's no affiliation with the denominational headquarters. So, you know, when we don't have the light bill, there's not like Baptist Church of USA over there in uh, Princeton, New Jersey to say, hey, can you send us some money? We came up short this week. We're independent, man. Right? There's blessings and then there's, you know, struggles. Amen. Um, so we strongly affirm our commitment to biblical truth and to these distinctives that define our name. This simple acrostic helps us sum up core distinctives of being a Baptist. Okay, number one is biblical authority. And um, so let's look here, uh, 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Timothy 3.16. This is the, one of the most, you know, basic, basic ones, really. And that is <clears throat> um, that we believe... That everything we believe is found in the Bible. And uh, we don't follow necessarily while we loosely follow. I mean, I read a lot of books. I've read and studied a lot of stuff. And, um, but we, we don't necessarily take our organizational orders from one particular man, right? Uh, or a, uh, uh, a group of people. People. So, um, so ultimately, uh, we take all of our beliefs uh, and our doctrine and even our practices from uh, the New Testament and uh, or from the Bible. Obviously, the New Testament is um, uh, is the most more specific about local church. I mean, Paul wrote a, much about the local church. God revealed things about the local church to Paul. And, uh, of course, John and Peter filled a lot, a lot in there, too, of course. But, but uh, Paul dealt a lot. God gave him a special dispensation as the apostle to the Gentiles in many of the Gentile churches uh, he was dealing with in his letters. So we have a lot of church doctrine and teaching from his letters. But, uh, so we would say biblical authority. What we believe, the Bible is our authority. Now, do we reference other books? Sure, of course we do. But, but ultimately, we believe that the Bible is the authority in all matters of faith and practice. And that's like a, that's something to, that, that phrase is something for us to remember and memorize. That we believe that the Bible is uh, the final authority on all matters of faith and practice, right? The Bible, the Bible is our final authority on all matters of faith and in practice. Now we believe the Bible, as it says here in 2 Timothy 3 16. I'm not going to go into all these verses uh, that are in the, the parentheses at each point, uh, but we do believe um, in, uh, in uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 15, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. So, I mean, think about that. So, Paul, uh, um, I'm sorry, Tim, um, uh, Timothy in his day when he was a child, he had the Holy Scriptures, right? And um, Paul said they, though they were holy, they were separate from God, and they were able to make thee wise into salvation. They, uh, they made you understand that salvation was in Christ, right? Verse 16, why? Because all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So we believe that the scripture is, the, is inspired of God, right? That God's spirit breathed from him, from his being and his essence, through and into a human being, and they wrote it down. And those words are not just the words of that human being. Those are God's words. 
Now, even though they might be couched with all the human particularities and educational level and vocabulary and personality of that individual human being, those words are what the Holy Ghost told him to write. Now, he didn't necessarily know that. I mean, you look at Paul sometimes, he says, uh, now I'm saying this, I don't believe the Holy Ghost told me this, but I'm saying this, you know, you shouldn't do this, blah, blah, blah. So even Paul sometimes, like, I'm not really sure. If what I'm saying right now is from the Holy Spirit, you know. But God used human instruments to write his Bible. Of course, uh, uh, over there uh, in 2 Peter 1, 20, 21, it says the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. They spoke and God moved them. And that word move is born along. That God literally bore carried words along from, uh, from his from his mind and his heart through and into the heart and mind of that individual, and he wrote it down onto paper. That's what we believe. Amen? Amen. So we believe from that then that our doctrine, our faith, that we believe how we practice, what we do, is initially and preeminently found in the Holy Bible. Is that good? You all, you all okay with that? Because not everyone believes that. I remember um, going to Dairy Queen some many years ago. And we're in line over there, and, and we, I'm coming up, and, and there was a, uh, a particular individual. He had a black suit on and a little white collar, and he was going on with an ice cream, and he went to go sit down in his car. And I thought, well, I'll go talk to him, right? He's enjoying his ice cream cone. So I remember, I was, so I gave him a track, and I'm witnessing to him and all that, and, and he's like, well, and I said, I just took a little angle. Sometimes I kind of want to be curveballs, you know, and I said, well, um, and, and I was quoting some Bible verse, and, and I said, well, wh what do you think about, about where the, the truth comes from, you know? He's like, well, you know, the, the saints and, you know, this person, St. Teresa in the 12th century said blah, blah, blah. And uh, I said, well, the Bible says, you know, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Ah, and he's like, you and your one book, and he's rolling up the rolling up the window. You and your one book. Because it says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's why we are people of the book. Amen? People of the book. They used that phrase back in 15, 1600. And those people, they, they were, what is up with these people? They try to live out of that book. They try to walk out of that book. They are people of the book. Now, that term or phrase was not only ascribed to Baptist people, okay? Um, but I am saying that we are and should be people of the book. Because some, they'll have different writings and, and that'll be, uh, uh, it'll be denominational information. But we are people of the book that believe in biblical authority of all that we believe and all that we <clears throat> ascribe to in practice, and at least try to practice. Amen? Uh, number, number two in the A is autonomy or self-governing of a local church. Now, what does that mean, the autonomy of, a, of the local New Testament church? It's similar to what I've already said as far as independent Baptists. I already gave a little bit already, but that means self-governing, autonomous, uh, uh, auto and namas, right? The law and self-governing, literally what it means. Self-governing power of the local church. That we are an independent body, right? Every local church should be independent of a hierarchical framework of outside governmental structure. Because if you look at the New Testament, it, it, they, they were all local churches. It was the church at that city, the church at that city, the church at that city. And what, what held some sway was, and I know you can't superimpose everything, what took place in the first century to today, okay? I, I'm, I'm, being, I'm understanding that. Doctrine did evolve over time as people wrote and thought and met together with councils and they worked some things out. I understand all that. I'm not saying all that is nothing. It's only what's in the, you know, I, okay? So I'm not like, 
countervailing everything I just said from biblical authority. Uh, but the, um, uh, but ultimately, all the, the, the local, they were local churches. What held them together, Paul was one who started in many of them. So he felt like a father to them. So he would travel around and make sure that, but he wasn't demanding. He didn't say, I'm the Pope over you people. No, he was, he was just making sure that you're all getting, and let, let's go put a preacher over here, and let's put preachers over here. So pastor, uh, preachers found preachers to oversee the people, and then he moved on to something else. And he came around, and if this per- person was, wasn't, they had to go get another preacher over here. And, and that, was the, that is a looser affiliation, not this hierarchical organization. Where it like a denomination, for instance, today where there's organization and a, 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 a bishop can take a pastor and put him over here for two years. Then I'm going to take you and put you over there for two years. And, and they might be praying and asking God and seeking wisdom to do that. Right. But ultimately, we have to believe the Bible teaches that each local church is self-governing. That's that's the idea. That's 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 the idea. Self-governing, um, a local church is independent, hierarchical, or, or uh, independent of a hierarchical frame or outside governmental structure. Um, and let me also add that it's also congregational in its authority. What I mean by that is one man, one vote. You know, we use that term d- demo- democracy, right? Oh, this person. Oh, if he, you know, has a microphone, democracy is going to die in the streets, you know. But, but we're not a democracy in America, right? But in the local church, we're a democracy. Now, we've got deacons that are people that the people represent and vote on a deacon to oversee some executive level. We have executive council, you know, so, that, but, but when it comes down to it, at the annual business meeting, one man, one vote. It's, de- it's democratic, right? And uh, we are, so, just, just so you understand. Uh, Colossians 1.18. Uh, I, see, I see our time is short. Let me just do one more. Let me do one more. Uh, look, we'll, look those, we'll, we'll save those verses up for later. Um, but let me end with this. one Because I want to get into some of the history. These are just the marks, Okay. Uh, the priesthood of the believer, the priesthood of the believer. And this is very uniquely um, the people of God over, uh, which, which we'll get into a little bit of the history. Uh, they, uh, they, they paid for this with their lives. It's priesthood of the believer. That means God's word assures believers that we have direct access to God through our relationship in Christ. We believe and teach that the priesthood of the believer is the unspeakably precious privilege of every child of God. That means that we have direct access to God. We don't need to go through a clergy member to get to God. That's what that means. Now, counsel helps. But the Bible says there's one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible says. So we believe the priest or the believer. That means because even in the book of Revelation, God says you are kings and priests. We are a priest. We are, you know, a priest is the one who represents the people to God and the priest represents God to the people, right? For the Old Testament. So you have direct access. You are the direct representation of God to the people. Well, that's who you and I are in Christ. We are a priest. We are a saint. The Bible calls us saints. Now, you might do some big miracle and, and be, you know, politically named a saint sometime later on. If you have X amount of miracles after your name. But we are, the Bible says, if you're saved, you're a saint. Saints, kings, Priests, we are we. That means that we have direct access to God. Let me look at uh, at Hebrews chapter four, and then we'll end today and get into our prayer time. Hebrews in chapter four. Hebrews chapter four. 
<clears throat> verse 14, Hebrews 4 and 14. It says, seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. In the Old Testament, under the old system of the law, uh, only the high priest was able to enter into the Holy of Holies beneath, behind the veil. But in the new covenant in Christ, when he, when he died on the cross, that great uh, curtain was ripped from, uh, uh, was ripped in two, and that signifying all those in Christ have direct access to the very throne room of heaven. Not only do we have access in general, but here the great high priest is imploring us to come. Come on in. Have intimacy with me. We are, we don't have to go through a priest. There is no priests in the New Testament order of a local church. Okay? You don't have to go through another human being to get to God. It's like, oh man, I, if only I can, you know, you know, go get an audience with this person and then go. Because, because. Power corrupts, and, and unfortunately, so much of Western civilization, uh, in particular, at least with a Christian nuance, of course, religious authority and manipulation are rife all over human history in general, but in particular, Christian uh, 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 history is, uh, is filled with power where this is understood, that I am the arbiter of your you have to go through me to get to God. The Bible says, call no man father. Now, that's not me. I didn't say that. The Bible says that. Call no man father. 